Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of a Gem of a Secret podcast. My name is Donatella My Secrets. And my name is Coco Gem Holiday. Coco, how are you doing tonight? Um, if I remain in these four walls any longer, I'm going to totally eventually murder you. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You heard it here, folks. Uh, my body is hidden somewhere in this house if I don't show up after quarantine. Um, the house is big enough, so she will be hidden. Yep. Yep. Coco um, just watched Tiger King again, and um, she's <laughs> got the tigers on the way to be our new backyard pets, and uh, my body will be gone. Sardine oil on the shoes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she definitely murdered her husband. Okay. She did. So this episode, we wanted to... We're, it's a poop... Look, a two-part series to where we're going to be talking about drag in a small town. It's kind of like um, a little bit of how we got our starts and some tips and tricks that we've learned about living in Grand Junction. I know for our Portland listener listeners, we talk about Grand Junction a lot, and this will probably got, give you guys like a better perspective about how we came up versus you know the stuff that we see here. Mm-hmm. Um, and stuff like that. So let's dive in. Donna. Yes. <laughs> well, the story starts. <laughs> year was 2013. Was it really? Yes, I okay. believe so. Okay, partying. <laughs> I was in college, um, partying up and wanting to um, eventually like do something that was out of my comfort zone because I always loved to perform. So I went out for this drag competition called Miss Drag CMU. And um, that is when um, Coco and our other member of the CDs, Stella, first saw me. And eventually we performed together at the very first Pride and formed a little group called the CDs. Yeah, so the CD stood for back then Coco, Donatella, and Stella. That's how we got the name. And it's actually funny because like we couldn't figure out a name and then literally Stella was like, it's the CDs. Yes. We're like, how'd you get that? And she's like, you guys are idiots. Um, yes. But anyway, so that started our history. And that's actually really what got me into business. And uh, now um, the CDs, we it is still our name for our website because it is Coco and Donatella Studios. Coco and Donatella Studios. Yes. Um, we killed Stella. She started Tiger King. Star- no, sure. <laughs> Why are we keep talking about murdering people? It's terrible. <laughs> that did not happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so one of the first stories I wanted to talk about um, was... So in a smaller community, you will have a lot of different experiences with drag than you probably do in a bigger one. As I've been in Portland for almost a year now, I can tell you that it is definitely different. So for the part one of this series, I wanted to talk about a couple of the different things that happened to me um, as well. So the first thing I was going to talk about is how um, drag parenting and drag children. Um, So I've never had a drag mother. Um, I think that's, I don't know if that was intentional or not. But uh, at one of the very first big shows, non-Pride related, that me and Donna were performing in together, um, Stella and Donatella both got adopted during that show. Mm -hmm. And so did a bunch of other people. And I was one of the few people who did not get adopted. And it did a number on my Mm self-esteem. And you wouldn't... When you're first starting in at drag, like, you really do want people to see the value in what you're offering. And that was really challenging at first. It really was. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess this is for the people who are, you know, drag veterans too. just make sure that when you're, you know, out there and you're adopting people left and right or something like that, um, just recognize that people see that and it can affect their experiences. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I have had a couple of drag mothers, so drag, drag mothers may be something for you. May, they may not be something for you as you may be wanting to learn, um, the process on your own or just pick it up from people that you really admire. Um, I learned that, you know, I definitely appreciated the people that took me under their wings. Some were more helpful than others. Um, but nowadays it's um I, I still have like the great drag family that um I really appreciate in Colorado and I still consider them um really awesome people and really great people. Um but I I kind of am a lone wolf out here in Oregon and I like that and that's okay. Yes. My tubes are tied, is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> so um one of the things that was that's really interesting about performing in a small town with a select few number of drag artists are is small town drag drama. 
Yeah. And I know that some of you bigger city entertainers have probably heard this before, but it is actually a thing. And just to think about it, like, you don't, there's not a lot of you. And you probably all know each other Mm -hmm. intimately. So it's like, it's even more dramatic in that sense. Because the scene is dependent on who is cool with whom. Yes, the scene is dependent (laughs) on if you like this person. And let me tell you, I used to think that I was a very agreeable person. Good heavens now. I think because there's some people out there, like, you have to imagine, people don't do drag because they are put together. Yeah. People do drags because they're a mess of a person. <laughs> like, I've, every drag artist well, I've ever met has something that makes them real unique. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't that the truth? We're all just a fucking stone cold pack of weirdos. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's so true. And Dr- Grand Junction, it was no different, but you just knew each other so personally. And there were, every fight, every argument every facebook drama to every to everything it just mattered Mm -hmm. it just and what i do mean is it truly mattered yeah yeah well i mean it was the situation where there were so few entertainers in the scene that if there was a problem then you your cast would be cut in half for Mm -hmm. you know a show or a few shows it depended on how long the the drama would last you know yeah so it was it was something that was really like detrimental to drag being around still because you have a lot of um big fish in a small pond i i would say that most drag entertainers are big fish in their own pond so like when you have all these egos and these people that um have different ideas about what they want to see for the scene kind of clashing Um, especially if there's people who have been in the scene for a certain amount of time and want that nostalgia that they used to have while there's another force of people that are creating something new in the scene, it definitely Mm -hmm. causes clash it. And it, it is something that, um, that does happen in smaller scenes. It's true. And one other point about that is some people would call us elitist. So me, so just a brief history here, me and Donatella probably performed Yes, actually, I can say this. Me and Donatella probably performed the the most and most often mm-hmm. in the city. And so what that meant was we had a lot of shows that we did that we produced. Mm-hmm. And what was happening because of that is that people weren't invited to every show, but the squeaky wheel, sorry, the, yeah, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Mm-hmm. And so people would be in the shows who had ever said they wanted to be in them. Yeah. I never, like, ever, you know, wouldn't let somebody perform or something like that, even though there was a hardcore reputation that you know we were elitist in that regard too yeah which i mean honestly if anyone just came to you and like said like if there was ever a clash or anything and they just said something and were like hey is it cool if i be part of the show you would have let them because you were that professional you would have just been like okay yeah that's fine like and plus we always knew that having more people in the cast would mean that more people would bring people to the bar too you know so it wasn't ever a case where it was like this person is never allowed. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. And it's so strange. It was so strange how that, it was such a defining moment too. Because mm-hmm. people made it sound like I was wielding this power. Yeah. And there wasn't any pow- power. Like, mm-hmm. I, funny thing is though, because um, we do, we want to talk about venues too here in a second. And we can yeah. transition to that. But one interesting story is I was told by, so the very first sorry, the very second venue we ever did shows at, I was told by the bar owner that monthly drag would not work in Grand Junction, Colorado. Mm-hmm. And by the time me and Donatella left, there was monthly drag and weekly drag. Yeah, um, there was at least a weekly drag event. Yeah, and they were all successful all the yeah. time. It was so... And maybe we had to grow into that, but... Yeah, maybe we had a couple of dead nights, but for the most part, like, we had a pretty good crowd. Like, we yes. we really did bring a good crowd when people knew that our shows were happening, especially when we had that monthly one at Barron's. We ended up having some really great nights there. Yeah, it was a pretty, yeah. pretty, pretty amazing, solid thing. Um, so, oh, here's, a, here's a, something positive, too. It was super easy to be locally famous and known. Yeah, for Um, sure. (laughs) I mean, yeah, that was really neat. I mean, not only did... So, I actually was born and raised in Grand Junction. So, it was the scene, not only that I came up in for drag, but I was born there. So, you know, I I started out bringing friends that I knew from, like, college or high school to the shows. And that's kind of, like, you know, they would kind of see. And um, eventually, you end up just getting this whole big crowd that's a mix of people. Sometimes old friends will be at shows later on down the line or, 
you know, sometimes it's someone that you just met at the supermarket that loves drag shows and has heard about your shows before, or, you know, there's a whole mix of people that had come out to see us perform and it was really neat to like meet up with them outside of what we were putting on. Well, and, and actually, as you say that, that's really interesting. And here's, here's some advice for you. Oh, I'll call them advice points. Here's another mm-hmm. advice point for you. If, especially if you're doing drag in a smaller city, your friends cannot maintain your shows. No, they never will. <laughs> that, that's not a thing. No. <laughs> Even in a bigger city, it's true. And I see people posting online all the time. I just can't get my friends to come out to shows. Guess what? If your friends have seen you in five shows, they've seen you in shows. Yeah. That's yeah. Period. It's point even, blank. It's even in bigger cities. Like, yeah, your friends, your friends won't come out to everything. And they may come out to them for like a few weeks at a time, but... They won't come out to shows unless you have an event like karaoke, like we did, which we would have our friends that were regulars and would show up every week for karaoke. So karaoke is a different beast, though. Yeah, we were actually told and this is actually some another advice point. Um, We were told that karaoke wasn't like the show experience Um, show. Drag shows are very interactive and they're loud and they're people and it's busy and it's drinking. And it's just this. it's like it's like going to an amusement park. Like There's a lot to do. And that's exhausting for people. Mm -hmm. So karaoke was a little bit more laid back. Yeah. Yeah. But that is a good thing, too, for people who are in a smaller town. Consider approaching bars about drag hosted karaoke or drag bingo, because that's another event that people it's a novelty event that people would like to come out for. And a lot of bars, a lot of venues might not necessarily want to do a drag show. Mm -hmm. So that is a really good um, approach. And yes, doing karaoke is a little bit more difficult. You have to have the equipment and like there's a lot of things involved in that. But bingo, like that's pretty easy. Just make sure you remember that there's a lot of laws in many states about bingo because it is technically gambling. Gambling. Yep. Yep. Um, so do we want to merge into venues? Yeah, definitely. So <laughs> the venue stuff is so fascinating. <laughs> As Donna said, like, you know, the the bingo stuff is a good thing, but remember about the gambling. But for our history, um, we did, we attacked it, um, we attacked it the way that we thought that we should. Mm-hmm. And um, we recognized that you are going to learn your venue and your bar and the bartenders and the patrons intimately. Mm-hmm. I've lived in Portland now um, since... I don't know. I think it's been like seven months, eight months, something mm-hmm. like that. Was, whatever. Um, I don't know the patrons intimately. No, I don't. I don't. I know some of the bartenders. I talk to them, mm-hmm. but I don't know them intimately. No. I don't know that they have a sister or a dad who. Yeah, because died you don't like... go over to their house to party afterwards like we used to. Oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> we used to do that. You We're know, that stupid. was a big thing. I think in small towns too, it was a big thing where like. The people who worked at the bar would we would go have a big like after show or after party or sometimes we would party at the bar. I'm not saying what bar, but I would be there till like four in the morning, way after the bar closed. Oh yeah, <laughs> I remember those days. <laughs> God, yeah, no. And, and, and the funny thing about gosh, Don, <laughs> I forgot about that. But yeah, smoking no. weed in the bar before recreational marijuana was legal in Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> You know, when I, it's here's the thing that's cool about that, though, is you do start to feel like you're part of the family. Yeah. And maybe if you're on cast at a place in a bigger city, you probably feel that way, too. Oh, I'm sure I that's the case. I do see a lot of the CCs and the stag mm-hmm. uh, drag entertainers, you know, saying yeah. that, saying those comments like my family, like even yeah. Rogue said it about local lounge. Um, you know, and we're getting there. We haven't been here very long. No, but... we've. I've only been here like a little over a year. Coco hasn't been here a year <laughs> <laughs> because I'm Donatella in full drag right now. Yes, gosh, I am so beat for the gods and right Coco now. Coco is serving the full feminine fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> um. Oh, there's a lot of. Here's the thing too. Um, if your city doesn't have drag, and I think we forgot to mention that. Um. If your city doesn't have a drag presence at all, Mm -hmm. they won't know what to do with you, per se. Even if they came from a bigger city or, like, they opened a bar in L.A. and they know all about drag. If they're not a drag entertainer themselves, this is going to be a new market for you. And in a positive and negative way. And let me explain. So they won't know certain things like how big you need a a dressing room. They're going to think of you like 
a band. They're gonna yeah. think they're gonna think that you need everything that a band needs because mm-hmm. they don't know how to relate it to you. Yeah. Um, and what you might need and what you might serve. So the responsibility really falls on you to not only teach etiquette for the audience and the patrons that come to your show, but also to kind of give a rundown of etiquette as a entertainer who um, gets paid from the establishment and um, has a certain level of expectations for the shows that you're putting in place. Yeah, and so just remember, what you know, um, what you know is probably going to be a little bit more than what they know. Um, and, and it's really what was really interesting is like having conversations because you have, you have to remember it takes time to get into drag. You can't go in for an emergency meeting. And here's the other two. Here's the other two cents. And me and Donna have been out as queer people and as drag artists for a very long time. Sometimes it's not safe to be out. You know, depending on the mm-hmm. kind of scene that you're in. Um, I never wanted to do business not being Coco, but to be able to do shows, I'm not going to beat a mug in the middle of the day to go no. down to talk to a bar owner to try to live my Miley Cyrus, Hannah Montana fantasy. Mm-hmm. And so people, if you want to do business in drag, you're going to have to remember, they're going to have to know what you look like out of drag. Yeah. And if you don't feel comfortable or safe doing that, don't do that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um. I guess as far as venues go, you're always going to face a number of obstacles with venue owners. And that doesn't change when you go to a bigger city. So there always will be some issues. But uh, I think a smaller city definitely has its own unique set of issues um, as far as operating as venue and entertainer um, as opposed to that in the city. Yeah. So interesting thing is so we threw a lot of community events back in Grand Junction, Colorado, and... I have to say there were positives and negatives to doing that. So in a, sometimes we would do a fundraiser. And I remember getting so many messages from people wondering why we didn't do a fundraiser for them mm-hmm. on like on a personal level. Like yeah. you personally attacked someone because you gave money to somebody else. Yeah, yeah. It's so weird. It was very strange. And it also there was like a weird kind of like toxic culture. If you were the first to step forward and want to do a fundraiser for someone, they all of a sudden questioned your intentions. <laughs> yeah, seriously. It was so weird being questioned on why you wanted to help out somebody. Yeah. Um, one of the stories that's incredibly beautiful is that we had a really amazing friend who passed away. Um, mm-hmm. And while she was still alive, um, we were throwing her a benefit show at one of the biggest venues in town at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, to help raise money for her care. Mm -hmm. And then the show was a month away. And literally in that four weeks of time, she actually even helped me design the poster for the show. Mm -hmm. Uh, She ended up passing away. But one of the final things she had said to me when she was still lucid um, was that she doesn't want any of the money to go to her specifically. Um, She just wanted to have the praise and the acknowledgement because she was going to be there. She's going to be there at the show. Yeah, And then she said, so I want you guys to keep the money because I know drag artists don't make a lot of money and like stuff like that. So you could partially make it go to me, maybe go to something else, something like that. Mm -hmm. And so we designed the poster. She agreed on it and stuff like that. Then eventually her health declined and went to hospital. So she eventually passed. And what happened, because smaller town mentality, um, people were very offended and thought that we were throwing an event to make money for ourselves off of our friend passing. Mm -hmm. It was incredibly toxic in that regard so the money ended up going towards her expenses anyway the money ended up going to so she said she didn't want the money to go to her hospital care yeah so i gave all the money to her hospice care yeah to her hospice care yeah yeah um and it was a beautiful it was still a beautiful evening even though we got boycotted um, (laughs) by some people in the queer community yeah yeah that was an uncomfortable experience and actually here's something too here's something on uh, not on on the same lines as that our audiences actually ended up starting to being a lot more straight than they were queer yeah because you have to remember they're in a smaller town there's not a lot of queer people just in general yeah like and so you need the straight people to like what you're doing yeah but the very small queer community that we had um in grand junction wasn't actually super supportive of our shows Um, the audience was primarily heterosexual and a lot of the people would be like college kids would come in and like see the show and just like want to watch it as well. So like, you know, 
the audiences weren't like this big supportive gay community like you have at a lot of shows in bigger cities Mm -hmm. um you weren't really always performing around your peers as much as you were performing around people that you were introducing the art of drag to right and haven't you found though that i've heard some things from people in bigger cities too that though that i think that might be the same yeah that gay bars don't tip you down they as yes. much as you might make money if you do a drag something yes at a straight that's bar. true yeah i mean that's true that's very true um yeah it's typically you make more money when there is like a crowd that is seeing drag as more of like a anomaly you know something mm-hmm. that is you know not that something that they're not used to so i think that's why people spend more money because it's kind of a novelty for them Mm -hmm. and then um while we're out performing in these queer spaces like what a lot of times you're seeing an entertainer's third time performing this song you know right so and then sometimes it may be new so maybe that's why you get a less interactive audience when you're in your own queer space as opposed to when you're outside of that space yeah Yeah. so switching topics to queer spaces Mm -hmm. um let's talk about pride yes i think this um has enough time to take up the end of this podcast and then we'll get on to (laughs) the rest of it but yeah, yeah pride um pride organizations and drag queens don't just have issues in small city and or in big cities um i actually thought it was specifically just a small city thing because of our experience um and that's not to say that our experience with pride in our city was all bad. We definitely had some great moments, but it ended on a bad note. Yeah, it did. Didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You made a video. Yeah. (laughs) I just remembered that. I made a video (laughs) that got like over a thousand views and like a lot of shares. (laughs) It got a lot of shares. Actually, I think it got like around like 2k views and I, yeah. Um, (laughs) <laughs> i was <Dang>. really mad <laughs> yeah well i mean so here's the thing um so drag artists get shafted by their pride organizations locally usually because they will ask local entertainers to perform for free or in the case of grand junction they didn't ask you to perform at all yeah um, yeah on the bigger stages yeah um and the only reason that me and donatella um got to do it is we raised money for our pride organization Mm -hmm. so they gave us a spot as kind of like a reward to perform yeah because we would always do a rummage sell every year where we would either have the money to bring out a headliner which was usually a rupaul's drag race girl um uh or another big name entertainer Mm -hmm. um from you know, around the country. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it was kind of something that we wanted to bring as far as drag went for a smaller audience. We wanted them to see an entertainer that wasn't just from this area and see different types and levels yeah, of drag. Yeah, to help refine their palette for drag. Yeah. So um, one of our lofty goals, and if you're going to throw sh- another advice point, um, once you start refining people's like um, palette for drag, start bringing out more um creative types like we brought out yeah. the first hyper queen we brought mm-hmm. out the first um the first out of town book booked drag king we yeah. bought um we brought uh, a singing queen we bought mm-hmm. a bearded queen we bought the first dragula girl like yeah. you know stuff like that we brought the first rupaul's drag race girl to grand junction yeah and, uh singing drag race girl so you know just like the whole spectrum of like these interesting types of people that you could book and like we booked pheromone before she was on drag race yeah she didn't come but we booked her <laughs> <laughs> whole other story for that yeah. um <laughs> but so prides prides in general Prides are a good opportunity, obviously, for you to get your name out there and to get known and for people to see your artwork. That's the time that you really should show out, um, especially because people are going to get to see you. Yeah. And That's, it, yeah. Our biggest thing that we wanted is as local queens to be showcased on the stage and perform. And it was a fight, it seemed, every year to try and get representation on the biggest stage, which was always Mesa Theater, um, as far as, like, performing for the nightlife of Grand Junction, you know, people that were our age and it was one of the more attended events um, during that Pride Fest. So Mm -hmm. it seemed like every year it was a fight um, and that we would have to do something like that in order to to get a spot on stage, which I think, you know, 
that's I guess that's an okay way to set it up as an organization, but um, it's a whole different set of issues when you treat the local entertainers as less than the out of town talent that is coming in. Yes, yeah, especially that. Um, though I will say I don't. Even though that sounds very negative on Pride as a whole, remember, Pride is a time for your celebration just as much as it is for everybody else's. Yeah. And drag queens and drag kings and drag artists across the board have always been heavily involved in Prides. So push back. Yeah. Um, Get involved with your local Pride organizations and, like, really make your voices and your concerns heard. Like, a lot of people tend to think that, I mean, I got it too, that, you know, wanting to be a part of Pride was because I wanted to make money. But um, I never fit in in a queer scene um, until I became a drag artist. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that that was me being queer was doing drag at Pride Mm -hmm. um, because I was so confused and felt super out of place because I wasn't this twink kid, you know, who was trying to get laid in a bus stop bathroom, you know, in between the bars. I just was walking around. No problem if you are that twink kid. We've known many. We've known many and they have a great (laughs) life. I'm just saying that I... Apparently that wasn't the life for me. And when I became a drag artist, got to meet Donatella and we had so many fun pride experiences in drag. Yeah. Um, it kind of changed the game a little bit. And so remember, it is for you too. And if you don't have a pride organization, maybe think about starting one in your smaller city. Definitely. I think we should end it with that note and we'll just pick back up um, talking about pride um, in the next episode. So to end this episode, actually, we do have another little special feature that we like to call Feeding the Positive. Feed the Positive. Which is basically where we select two entertainers from the scene that we're in or that we've been noticing um, that are doing some cool things. And my entertainer this week for this episode is Ann J. Tifa. You can follow them on Instagram at A-N-N-E-J-T-I-F-A-H. They've been doing a different look every day for quarantine um, that has uh, since it uh, was announced. And they have some really awesome looks on their Instagram. So make sure you give them... Uh, some likes, give them a follow, and um, yeah, show them some support. Who's yours, Coco? So mine is going to be the one, the only, Shandy Evans. Yes. The girl who decided to make Portland's biggest war ever over like eggnog and mint chocolate chip ice cream. And by the way, I hate mentioning mint chocolate chip ice cream as well. So I agreed with her on that. (laughs) The eggnog thing, though, she can die. Um, <laughs> so you can find Shandy Evans. Um, she is at Rainbow Whale on Instagram. R A I N B O W W H A L E. Such a lovely Instagram <laughs> handle right there. I know. At Rainbow Whale. <laughs> so ridiculous. But seriously, Shandy is amazing at drag like and has a really artistic and interesting style um literally just check her out of course we'll have a couple of photos of both of these individuals on our website at what's our website our website is a gem of a secret podcast.com that is a gem of a secret (laughs) podcast.com i was gonna say at a gem of a secret podcast i was like why (laughs) i I always want to say at whatever oh it's because how we end yeah yeah exactly (laughs) Well, all right, that was it for tonight's episode. We'll catch you next week, everyone. My name is Donatella My Secrets. And my name is Coco Gem Holiday. You can follow me at Donatella underscore My Secrets on Instagram. And you can follow me at, at Coco Gem Holiday on Insta. Yes, and you can listen to us anywhere you listen to podcasts. Thanks for tuning in again. Bye!